All right, well, here we are, uh, first lecture. We're trying to make something good out of a bad situation. So all you got to do is pay attention. Uh, we're going to talk about phase change diagrams. And the first one we're going to do is this is the heating curve. So on the y-axis, I have temperature from negative 30 to 130. And on the x-axis, it's a little bit different. It's in minutes, but every minute we heat the solution up, it's going to pump in 200 joules of heat energy. Every minute is 200 joules of heat energy. We are going to start right here at negative 30. And at negative 30, obviously, water is totally frozen. So what's going to happen is, as we're pumping in the heat energy, the ice is going to go from negative 30 and it's going to get warmer, 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 but it's not going to melt until it hits its melting point. So here's what it looks like. One minute, it's about negative 20. Two minutes, it's negative 10. Three minutes, right here, it's at its melting point. Now, after its melting point, it's going to take a couple minutes for the entire sample to melt. So here's what this looks like. Then after it's all melted, then it's going to shoot up to its boiling point, and then it's going to boil, boil, boil until all the liquid turns to vapor and then it's going to go up again. Now, that's the heating curve. What's going on is this. We are putting heat in to the liquid, which is water. So it's going to go from solid to liquid to gas. So we're going like this. It's going from solid to liquid to gas. Now, since we are heating it up, it's going to be and endothermic. So heating curves are endothermic reactions going from solid to liquid to gas. So we're going to put endo up here, E N D O. All right, I hope you're with me right now. Cooper, no questions until this is done. Now, what's going on? We have to take phase by phase by phase. First of all, you know that it's not, ice is not melting until it gets to the melting point. So we're going to go like this. And we're going to mark it MP for melting point. Now remember, this is only for water. It's not for any other liquids. This is just a water heating curve. Now, up here, this is the boiling point. And that is right here, BP. So we're all good. Remember, two fixed points on a, a thermometer got to be going up. It has to be the melting point and the boiling point coming down. It's going to be the condensation point and the freezing point. Now, question. Remember, kinetic energy is energy of motion, and it's ruled by temperature. So this first line segment, we're going to label these line segments now. We're going to have A, B, C. D, E, and F. So those are the line segments. And line segment A to B, the temperature is going from negative 30 to zero. So the temperature is going up. So if kinetic energy is ruled by temp, then from line segment A, B, we're going to put this over here. Line segment A, B, the kinetic energy, Ke, is going to go up. So line segment AB, kinetic energy goes up, potential energy stays the same. But look at here, once the, once the ice hits the melting point, temperature doesn't change. We're going to figure out why in a minute, but the temperature doesn't change from B to C. So if there's no temp change, there is no change in kinetic energy. There still is kinetic energy, but there's no change. So for line segment BC, there's no change in kinetic energy, but there is an increase in potential energy. So we're going to go PE goes up. 
All right. Now, from line segment C to D, there's a huge jump from 0 to 100. So if the temperature goes up, Ke goes up. So C to D, C to D, Ke jumps way up there. Now, from D to E, no temp change. So D to E, there's an increase in potential energy. And finally, you get the idea. There's a temperature increase from E to F. So line segment E to F, there is an increase in kinetic energy. So that takes care of kinetic and potential energies. But the question is, why isn't there a temp change from minute 3 to minute 8? Why the heck isn't there a temp change from 3 to 8? We're putting in 200 joules of heat energy per minute. Well, what's that heat energy doing? Well, what you have to remember is when you make a bond, energy is released. So in order to break a bond, you have to put energy in to break the bond. So that heat energy, the 200 joules per minute, that's being used to break the ice bonds. So once all the ice bonds are broken at minute eight, then the temperature of the water can go back up. But let's talk about this flat section right here. What's going on on this flat section? Well, we're going from this to this. We're going from solid to liquid. So if we're going from solid to liquid, that's a phase change. So the plateaus on the heating curve are phase changes. So that's a phase change. And that phase change is going from solid to liquid. Uh, and it's, I don't like this, but melting, the water's melting, it's called fusion. That's the way it is. So we're going to put down melting equals fusion. Now, on your reference tables, Reference table B, the first thing on reference table B is called the heat of fusion. I don't know if you're going to be able to see it, so I'm not going to show it to you. But the heat of fusion is this. It's called HF, heat of fusion, and it's 334, 334 joules per gram. Now, what that means is it takes 334 joules of heat energy to melt one gram of ice. Now, one gram of ice would be the weight of a paper clip. And you could melt one gram of ice in your hand. So that means your body temperature would have to give 334 grams of heat energy to melt that one gram of ice in your hand. All right. Now, if I had 10 grams of ice in my hand, no problem. I would simply go 10 times the heat of fusion. And that's your first formula. The first formula on the heating curve is this. Q equals M times HF. That is your first formula. Q equals M times HF, but we're going to go over that in the second video that I'm going to post. All the math is going to be in the second video. I'm just trying to explain what's going on up here first. All right. So this is our first formula. Q equals M times HF. Very easy, but remember, all liquids have a different heat of fusion. So water's heat of fusion is 334 joules per gram. If I asked you to find the heat of fusion for another liquid, and you found out that the liquid had a 200 joule per gram heat of fusion, you would know, hey, it takes less heat to break those bonds. So you would know this. You would know that liquid has a weaker intermolecular force than water. Got it? OK, and you have to remember, water has one of the strongest intermolecular forces of any liquid. All right, so let's go on. As we're going on, so once all the ice bonds are broken, we are at C right here. All the ice bonds are broken. Now, 
what happens now is since we don't need any heat energy to break any more ice bonds, the heat energy is used to increase the temperature of the water. So it goes from zero to 100. Here's another formula. And this one is a little bit tougher than Q equals M times HF. This is Q equals M times delta T times C. So that formula, it's in the back of your reference table, like Q equals M times HF. Heat energy equals mass times change in temperature times specific heat. Now, specific heat is how fast something heats up and how fast something cools down. Now, the very cool thing, I like specific heat, especially of water, because the specific heat of water on your reference table, reference table B, is this, 4.18 joules per gram Kelvin. That's a heck of a unit right there. But here's what it means. Well, let's just talk about water has the highest specific heat of any natural substance on Earth, 4.18. That's why all our lakes are surrounded by vineyards because the lake water takes a long time to heat up. So if it's a warm day, we don't want the grapes to blossom too early because a frost will kill them. So the cold air coming up from the cold water will keep it in springtime. And then around October, the lake water is still warm because it has a high specific heat. It takes a long time for the heat to go away. It keeps the grapes from freezing. If there's a frost, the warm air coming off the water will keep the grapes safe. So that's specific heat. And most metals have a specific heat of less than one, which means metals heat up fast and they cool down fast. Next. So, like I said, that's the second formula. We'll be talking about that in the next lecture. The next thing is we got a plateau up here. So, plateaus means phase change. Phase change, this one would be liquid to gas. Now, this one I like better because remember, fusion means melting, but this one really sounds like what it does it's vaporization and on reference table B the heat of vaporization is 2200 and I think 60 joules per gram that is a heck of a lot higher than 334 so why in the world does it take 2260 joules to change liquid to steam, and why does it only take 334 joules to change one gram of ice to water? Ah, back to bonding. Bonding's the most important chapter in chemistry. So, the reason is because we have hydrogen bonds to break between the water molecules. And remember, water has strong intermolecular forces. That's why it takes 2,260 joules of heat energy to just break the bonds in one gram of water. Okay, hopefully you're hanging on, doing good so far. Uh, we have that formula, Q equals M times HF. We have that formula, Q equals M times delta T times C. And now we have this formula up here. It is Q equals M times HV. So we have three formulas, but like I said, we're going to go over those in the next lecture. So here's number one, Q equals M times HF. Number Q2, Q equals M times delta T times C. And number three, Q equals M times HV. Next, what the heck is this from E to F? Uh, this is a weird one because if you think about this, if you have a pan and it has a block of ice in it with a thermometer in it and you start heating it up, the ice will heat up but it won't melt until it gets to the melting point. 
then the ice in the pan will start melting. And once all the ice is melted, the temperature shoots up to 100 and the water boils. And the water's boiling off, making vapor. But the vapor just goes up into the air and it cools down. So what is this line segment E to F? The only way to get that line segment E to F would be in a closed container. So this line segment right here, you need a closed container. And we just went over how you make the boiling point high if you're at elevation. You use a pressure cooker. So the only way we can get line segment E to F A pressure cooker would be a great way to do that, because don't forget, in a pressure cooker, the more pressure pushing down on the liquid, the more vapor pressure needed to equal it to boil. So in a pressure cooker, the boiling point is much higher than regular water on a stove. So this is your heating curve. And we have the plateaus are the phase changes. Fusion is melting, vaporization is going from liquid to gas. Now, you should know all the kinetic and potential energy ones. What we're going to do is we're going to do all the math on the next, on the next one. So, what I should show you is I should show you next, I can show you what the cooling curve looks like. But this is why I like chemistry, because they're always opposites. Acids, bases, metals, non-metals. Heating curve, cooling curve. So everything on the heating curve is going to be like opposite on the cooling curve. So we'll go over the cooling curve uh, very quickly. So. We have the same thing. We have temp on this side, but on this side, for every minute, we lose 200 joules of heat energy. So the cooling curve looks like this. Just like that. And so we have A to B to C to D to E to F. And if this were water, That would be 100 degrees C. That would be 0 degrees C. And then down here, time. And same thing, 200 joules per gram. But that's lost. Let's go like this. 200 joules lost per minute. Okay, I'm not going to put the time down. You get the idea. But the 100 degrees on the way down, it's going to look like this. This is gas. This is gas to liquid. This is all liquid. This is liquid to solid. And this is all solid. Since this is a cooling curve, we're releasing heat. So what we're doing is this is going from gas to liquid to solid. This is losing, and that's exo. So this is an endo, uh, excuse me, this is an exothermic. So the cooling curve is an exothermic, and the heating curve is an endothermic. Now, coming down to 100, that's the boiling point going up, but it's the condensation point going down. So you can put condensation point. And going down, this is the melting points going up, but this is the freezing point, FP. That's the freezing point going down. Again, the plateaus are phase changes, but now it's a little bit different. Temperature's going down. That means kinetic energy decreases from A to B. From B to C, potential energy decreases. C to D, kinetic energy decreases. D to E, potential energy decreases. E to F kinetic energy decreases. So the highest kinetic energy on this chart would be right here. 
at the top. Hopefully you all understand that. Now, the trick question that I saw in the regions was this. They gave something like this, and then they said, what if instead of losing 200 joules per minute, we lost 400 joules per minute? Well, if we lost 400 joules per minute, everything would happen faster, and this graph would only take up half the space. In other words, it would be solid somewhere around here. So the graph would be here to here to here to here to here. Everybody understand that? Now, if I went, instead of taking 200, if I only made 100 joules of heat energy lost, then it would be twice as long. Hopefully you understand that. So, that's what we're going to be talking about. That's what your packet is. You can do some questions in the packet now, but the next, the next video I'm going to give you will be all about the math, those three formulas. Q equals M times HF, Q equals M times delta T times C, and Q equals M times HV. That will be in the next lecture, and there's a lot of problems that we're going to do. All right, hopefully you understood that.